Good afternoon. My name is Francisco Leon. I am the Chief Scientific Officer of Prevention Bio. And it's a great honor for me to be speaking with you for a few minutes about the history of the development of medications in celiac disease. I want to thank Marilyn and the Celiac Disease Foundation for this kind invitation to the Patient Education and Advocacy Summit. By way of disclosures, I've been working in celiac disease for a very long time, more than 25 years. I did my PhD in celiac disease in the 90s, and I have been CEO, CSO, Chief Medical Officer of several companies, such as Alba Therapeutics, Cellimmune. I have um, started uh, three companies, including Glutenostics, and also work with Biomedal in the diagnostics space. So. Um, I do have um, a witness position to the development of celiac, which I would like to share with you. The first thing that we need to ask ourselves when we think about whether we should develop a drug for a disease is whether there is really an unmet need or not. In the case of celiac disease, clearly uh, the gluten-free diet is not a solution. And that was the big realization that drove the, the entire field. We know that even though gluten-free diet is efficacious at quickly reducing symptoms and intestinal damage, it's very hard to completely heal as little as 50 milligrams of gluten a day and compare that to 20,000 milligrams in a normal diet. 50 milligrams will drive intestinal inflammation and symptoms. So clearly there is a need to address what we call now gluten-free diet, non-responsive celiac disease uh, due to consumption of gluten on the diet. The gluten-free diet is very burdensome. And in this study from Dan Leffler and collaborators, we learned that Celiac disease has the second highest burden of disease treatment of a long list of diseases, only second to end-stage renal disease and dialysis. So very high burden of the gluten-free diet in celiac and still not effective. That is why patients have been asking for adjuncts to the gluten-free diet, medicines that will allow cross-contamination to be tolerated or intercepted so that it doesn't cause damage. Almost 90% of patients want a, an adjunct to a gluten-free diet. And a good number of patients are also interested in avoiding the diet altogether. So um, in addition to checking the first box, which is, yes, we have a need for a new medication, the next thing we need to realize is for a single drug to be approved by the FDA, we need to have dozens of drugs in development in order for one of them to make it through the, through the end line. We need investors, private investors to contribute as much as $1 billion on average for each drug that will make it through market because of the high degree of failure. If we don't have at least five drugs in clinical development, we are not gonna get one approved. The advantage that we have in celiac disease is that we understand the pathophysiology, that is the mechanism of the disease better than most diseases. And that is the one thing that we have going for us. We know that gluten crosses the gut barrier and it gets modified by an enzyme called transglutaminase. It's presented by antigen presenting cells to lymphocytes. And there are a number of inflammatory cytokines. One of them is interleukin-15 and others that activate cells called intraepithelial lymphocytes, the IELs, which kill the cells in the gut mucosa, in the gut wall. We also know that the T lymphocytes activate B lymphocytes to make antibodies, which are the markers of the disease. So armed with this knowledge, we started in this field with a few pioneers. The first company in the development of drugs for celiac was Alvine, started by Professor Chaitan Koshla in California with a glutenase, ALV-003. 
which is currently being developed by Immunogenics. Alba Therapeutics, and I worked at Alba, was the second company, Professor Fasano, with laracetide acetate, currently in development by nine meters. Chemocentrics with Traficet, which did not work. Immusen T, Bob Anderson, with an Xvax2, a vaccine, which also did not show efficacy in phase two. And the University James Cook in Australia with Necator Americanus infecting patients with a worm to fool the immune system against uh, reacting against gluten. Of all of these companies, it's interesting that most of them don't no longer exist. Alvine doesn't exist, Alba doesn't exist, Immusant doesn't exist, Chemocentric no longer works in celiac, and the James Cook University trials have not shown efficacy except symptomatic efficacy, but no gut efficacy. So this just tells you the high degree of failure and attrition in drug development. But all of these pioneers did create a fertile ground for the current explosion of research that we see. Today, we have over 25 programs, half of them in clinical development here in green, and another half in blue in preclinical stage of development. So now we have critical mass, which is what we need to ensure that in the next three to five years, we are going to have drugs making it in front of the FDA for approval. I'm not going to go over every company, we don't have time today, but just in high level, there are companies working on modifying gluten. That would be very interesting. However, it will imply you can only eat that modified gluten. So it's still leaving some unanswered questions. Nine meters again, developing laracetide. It's in phase three for symptomatic improvement in celiac disease. The um, knowledge about transglutaminase by Professor Schuppen in Germany led to Sedira developing a transglutaminase inhibitor. And Professor Koshla has his own program with Citari. We also have all the glutenases, again, immunogenics with latiglutenase, now Takeda entering in the space with what uh, was previously PVP, Cumamax, now called TAC 062. We also have all the um, attempts to block the key cytokine, interleukin-15, the key driver of intraepithelial lymphocytes. The company I work for, Provention, has a program in phase 2B partnered with Amgen called PRV015 or AMG714. We're currently recruiting for the proactive celiac study. Joe Murray has been doing work in refractory celiac disease as well with an anti-interleukin-15 receptor. And there are a number of other preclinical programs for IL-15, Calypso, Bionis, and others. The most interesting um, final aspect of this development is the attempt to manipulate immune tolerance. And there are many, many companies in the immune tolerance space. Probably the most advanced is Takeda's TAC 101. Uh, and this was formerly Coors company, course company uh, MPGLI, now in phase 1B slash 2A. There are others like Anokion that have also made it through the clinics and are now developing their own version of immune tolerance agents and multiple preclinical companies. The message I want to leave you with is that we are in a good moment for celiac disease research. We have a lot of activity, but there's one thing that is essential and that is for patients to participate in clinical trials. All of these trials require volunteers. If we don't have volunteers, we will not be able to complete the trials on time. We will not be able to get support financing for these studies. So while I leave you with a very, very big thank you to all of the patients who make research possible and to the Celiac Disease Foundation for leading this field, I also leave you with a plea. Uh, please join the studies We'll try to make it as easy as possible for you, and especially in time of COVID, we'll try to make it very safe and uh, together advance the field. Thank you very much.